everyone. My name is Maria Teresa I. Cabaraban. I am a faculty of the Chemical Engineering Department of Xavier University. I am also the university's Research Ethics Coordinator and, concurrently, the Chair of the University's Research Ethics Board. This presentation is the second of two parts, the general aim of which is to discuss the processes and guidelines by which research proposals are evaluated by the University Research Ethics Board to determine whether or not they meet the quality and ethical principles and standards for research involving human participants as set out in the National Ethical Guidelines for Health and Health-Related Research. I started with a discussion of the basic concepts and the basis for ethics review of research protocols. In this second presentation, I will discuss how research proposals are reviewed by the XU Research Ethics Board or REB. I hope that by the end of the presentation, you would have obtained a better understanding and appreciation of the research ethics review. This presentation, as you can see on this slide, comprises only of two parts. I will start with a brief discussion about the Research Ethics Office of Zayer University or the XUREO. In the second half of this presentation, I will discuss how XU Research Ethics Board or XUREB uh, reviews the research proposals. The XUREO was created by the Office of the University President in June 2018 and is mandated to implement the policies of the University Research Council in matters pertaining to research ethics. Our physical office is located on the second floor of Lucas Hall, the same building that houses the Kinaadman University Research Office. The office personnel consists of the research ethics coordinator, an administrative staff, and a bookkeeper. Our web address is indicated on the slide, and you may email us at xu, uh, reo at xu.edu.ph, or you may call us at 853 9800-LOCAL-9167 Due to challenges to REO resources brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, our staff is still under reduced work week arrangement. We may take longer than usual to respond to your emails. You may send us a follow-up email if you have not heard from us three days after sending us your the creation of the office is aligned with the university's commitment to the attainment and sustainability of a strong research culture among faculty and students and promotes high quality research that is conducted at a high level of academic rigor and carried out to high ethical standards. The XUREO is thus housed under the the Office of the Dean for Research. It serves as the administrative office that supports the ethics review and approval process for research involving human participants and for research, teaching, and testing involving vertebrate animals. The mandate of the XUREO therefore covers compliance aspects of conducting research responsibly according to the type of research. As I mentioned earlier, it consists of the REB and the IACUC. The Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee or IACUC ensures that the highest animal welfare standards are maintained along with the conduct of accurate and valid scientific research 
through the guidance and review of every project proposed to include the use of vertebrate animals at XU. You may learn more about the XU IACU at the website or web page indicated on the slide. The REB, on the other hand, reviews all research at XU involving human participants, including protocols to gather data from participants of dissertations and theses. It is comprised of 15 members who are duly appointed by the university president. Rex or research ethics committees are formed with membership from the REB members. The XUREX review research protocols involving human participants and their data to ensure that these protocols agree with local and international ethical guidelines. Their main responsibility is to protect the participants involved in the study and also to consider the possible risks to the community and the environment. The ethics committees have the authority to approve, reject, modify, or stop studies that do not conform to the accepted standards. They also monitor studies once they begin and, if necessary, may take part in follow-up actions after the end of the research. This then begs the question of how ethics review of protocols are conducted or is conducted by the REC or RECS. However, before going into the house of the ethics review process, I think understanding why there is a need for our protocols to go through this process allows us to see the big picture. And why is seeing the big picture important? Is it not true that when we have the bigger perspective, we can be more effective, safer, and hopefully more successful as a researcher. Many kinds of ethical issues can arise in scientific research, especially when it involves human participants. As researchers, we are intruding into people's lives, asking them for the most part to do things that they would not have otherwise have done and collecting information that they might not otherwise have given. All research has the potential to impose some measure of harm, ranging from the minor inconvenience of one's time being taken up to possible loss of life. Every researcher needs to identify the possible harms and potential benefits of their research to their research participants, to the scientific community, and to the society in general. In order for research to result in benefit and minimize risk of harm, it must be conducted ethically. Exus review processes are intended to ensure this whilst remaining sensitive to the needs of the researchers. Ethical review is about helping you as a researcher to think through the ethical issues surrounding your research the principles of good research practice. For example, respect for persons, beneficence, and justice encourage you to consider the wider consequences of your research and engage with the interests of your human participants. But wait, so that we are on the same page, let me first clarify what is meant here by human participant. Here, we distinguish between the researcher or investigator who conducts the research and the participant, living participant, not diseased, from whom or about whom the researcher obtains his 
or her data through intervention or interaction. The term intervention applies to any activity involving both physical procedures by which data are gathered and manipulations of the subject or the subject's environment. On the other hand, the term interaction includes communication or interpersonal contact between investigator and the individual. By the way, subjects, the term subjects is traditionally used in experimental or quasi-experimental designs where those involved in the research react to the intervention. Respondents are used for survey designs where those involved respond or answer structured or semi-structured questionnaire. Okay, to continue, our data may also come in the form of identifiable private information. Private information is information that is associated with individuals or groups of individuals which could reveal details of their lives and other characteristics that could impact them. This includes information about behavior that occurs in a context in which an individual can reasonably expect that no observation or recording is taking place and information that has been provided for specific purposes by an individual and that the individual can reasonably expect will not be made public. For example, our medical records, our school records, and even our tax record. Private information is not necessarily information that, on its own, linked to individuals directly. For example, the combination to a bank safety deposit lock is private, but the combination number itself does not necessarily point to a specific individual. Identifiable private information or personally identifiable information is information about an individual that identifies, links, relates, or is unique to or describes him or her. Examples of identifiable private information include names, addresses, birth dates, phone numbers, our email addresses, identifying numbers such as our social security number or our taxpayer identification number. Our employment details also are private information, identifiable private information, as well as our photos that we posted perhaps on Facebook. So, now I think we are ready to discuss the research ethics review process, which may appear to some like the proverbial black box. An application is submitted and considered and a decision is made. That is, the process is submit, review, decision. In reality, the research ethics review involves more than just the REB or the REC. Contributing to the overall review process are other stakeholders and their roles in the development and submission of the application and the subsequent movement of the application back and forth between researchers, administrative staff, reviewers, chair, until ideally the application is deemed ready 
for approval. We may want to visit the Research Ethics Office website where you will hopefully find information useful when you apply your protocol for ethical review. If you click on the Review Process tab, you will be direct directed to a page that will hopefully guide you through the review process. The researcher initiates the process of ethics review by developing a proposal and submitting it for review by a technical or scientific panel. The scientific panel is a group of scientists and other experts that reviews the proposal for scientific quality and correct study design. If the scientific review panel deems the proposal to be lacking in scientific merit, it is sent back to the researcher for revisions. The researcher then resubmits the revised proposal and the scientific review panel assesses whether the researcher has sufficiently addressed the recommended revisions. If not, it is again sent back to the researcher for revisions. These are important steps in the overall review process because a protocol cannot be ethically acceptable if it does not conform to standards of good research design and conduct. In this sense, a scientifically sound research design is the first step in developing an ethically acceptable protocol. Else, if the proposal is deemed to pass the scientific scrutiny of the scientific review panel, the researcher may then submit the protocol or the proposal that has been approved by the scientific review panel together with other relevant documents to the XUREO for ethical review. All ethics review documents must be submitted to the XUREO through email. The following are the relevant documents for the review. The REO requires the submission of the full protocol to be reviewed. The research protocol that we refer to here follows the proposal stage. It is meant to detail a study's methodology to meet specified ethical norms for human subjects. It should clearly and plainly provide an overview of a proposed study in order to satisfy ex-use guidelines for protecting the safety of human participants who might be adversely impacted by the research. The ethical risk filter form will help determine whether the protocol requires ethical review or is exempt from ethical review. If you answer no to all five questions, then the protocol qualifies for a recommendation for exemption. This form must be completely filled out, signed, and dated. Another important document is obviously the application form for ethical review. The first section of the form requires general information about the study. Except for the XU REC package number, which will be filled out by the REO administrative staff, the researcher needs to completely fill out the required information and tick the relevant boxes. The study site refers to the facility in which the protocol or study activities will be conducted. For example, the study site is the site where a clinical trial or a clinical study will be conducted, or 
this is the site where the laboratory experiments will be performed or this is the site or communities where the participant or subject encounter occurs. These sites could be online or real-time sites or communities. Section 2 of the application form requires information about the principal investigator as well as the co-investigators. Section 3 is on the declaration of conflict of interest. The term conflict of interest in this section of the application form refers to situations in which personal, family, or financial considerations may compromise or have the appearances of compromising a researcher's professional judgment in conducting or reporting research resulting from being unduly influenced by a secondary interest such as financial gain or career advancement. The resultant bias may be conscious or unconscious of the part of the researcher. Declaring conflicts of interest, therefore, and the effective management of these conflicts are critical for maintaining the integrity of the research. In Section 4 of the application form, the researcher pledges to comply with his or her ethical responsibilities. Section 5, on the other hand, of the application form should be signed by the chair of the scientific review committee or the head of the office that reviewed the scientific soundness of the study and issued the appropriate approval. This section should be completely filled out, signed, and dated. The institutional endorsement should be signed by the head of the unit or office under which the researcher is affiliated, for example, the dean, director, and the like. This section should also be completely filled out, signed, and dated. Section 7 of the application form should be signed by the signatory official who can sign on behalf of the institution that has oversight on the research site. If the research site is outside the scope of authority of XU or the principal investigator is a non-XU personnel. Other relevant documents that are study specific include the participant information sheet which gives potential participants the necessary understanding for the motivation and procedures of the study and the sources of information to answer any further questions to allow them to give informed consent. The participant information sheet or PIS should be a clear and simple document on headed paper with a university crest or equivalent for other institutions that would be easily understood by those to whom it is aimed. For example, it should be age appropriate. It should be a concise document. The length and design should encourage a potential participant to read it in full. A participant consent form essentially reprises the information in the participant information sheet to ensure the key points are understood and then records this understanding usually with a signature. The ethical principle on respect for persons requires that subjects to the degree that they are capable be given the opportunity to choose what shall or shall not happen to them. 
The consent process contains the elements of information, comprehension, and voluntariness. The Code of Research establishes specific items to, for disclosure intended to assure that participants or respondents or subjects are given sufficient information. These items generally include the research procedure, their purposes, the expected duration of participant involvement, risks, anticipated benefits, alternative procedures where therapy is involved, a statement describing the extent if any to which confidentiality of records identifying the subject or the participant will be maintained for research involving more than minimal risk an explanation as to whether any compensation or an explanation as to whether any medical treatments are available if injury occurs and if so what they consist of or where further information may be obtained. It also includes a statement that participation is voluntary. Refusal to participate will not involve in any penalty or loss of benefits to which the subject is otherwise entitled and the subject may discontinue participation at any time. And it should include a statement offering the participant the opportunity to ask questions and to withdraw at any time from the research. Additional items have been proposed, including how subjects are selected, the person responsible for the research, etc. A documented and signed or a thumb-printed informed consent document is necessary in scientific studies involving human participants or subjects. If no written consent can be obtained, verbal consent has to be documented by a witness who signs with the interviewer or researcher. For studies that do not involve more than minimal risk to the participants or subjects, informed consent may be obtained electronically, for example, through text, graphics, audio, video, or passive or interactive websites. Electronic informed consent includes a number of ways of obtaining informed consent without, with supportive electronic information from a computer or tablet-based process at the study site to a completely remote internet-based process. Here, comprehension of the consent materials may be addressed by ticking a checkbox of say, I understand and agree, or by mandatory quizzes as a comprehension check. The manner and context in which information is conveyed is equally important as the information itself. Therefore, consent forms must be brief, direct, and should aid understanding in research participants. It is recommended to use simple language for English language consent document as well as a translation in local languages which is straightforward and easy to understand. The researcher will also be required to submit the informed consent assessment form duly filled out also uh, required for submission is a copy of the study instruments, the interview questions, the FGD guide, and other data collection forms. The briefing is the counterpart to the informed consent stage that occurs when participants are recruited for research. 
it is an important consent component of study designs involving the deception of human participants. Debriefing is the act of informing participants about the intentions of the study in which they just participated. During this process, researchers reveal any deceptions that occurred and explain why deception was necessary. Debriefing typically occurs at the conclusion of the participant's study involvement. The main purpose of participant recruitment is to inform and invite potential participants or subjects to participate in the research study. Advertisements and recruitment materials are typically thought of as, a, as the beginning of the informed consent process and include flyers, emails, social media, and telephone. Prior to posting or distribution, the XUREV must approve the final content of any and all advertisements and recruitment materials. Consent is a term used to express willingness to participate in research by persons who are, for example, by definition, too young to give informed consent but who are old enough to understand the proposed research in general, its expected risks and possible benefits, and the activities expected of them as participants. Assent by itself is not sufficient, however. If assent is given, informed consent must still be obtained from the participant's parents or guardian or legally authorized representative. Other relevant documents include copies of letters to parents or guardians or children for studies involving children or educational institutions. The Memorandum of Agreement or the Memorandum of Understanding for Collaborative Studies and Data Management Plan, but only when this is required by the funder and where applicable and available. If the research is targeting sp a specific group outside or external to Xavier University, the researcher must first obtain the relevant permission or approval from the head of office to approach the group as appropriate. This applies to any form of research involving such groups. For example, through our focus group discussions, uh, surveys, interviews, etc. Likewise, all external researchers who wish to recruit Xavier Ateneo staff, students, or faculty as participants in research studies are required to seek permission to do so. When cultural communities are identified as the research and the indigenous COP peoples are participants in research, the National Commission for Indigenous People or NICP clearance must be submitted to the XUREO as part of the submission package. It is ethically required that researchers be in compliance with national and international rules and regulations. Therefore, the researcher is also required to submit to the XUREO um, clearance or permit from respective regulatory authorities such as the FDA for approval for clinical trial, trials or DENR for local transport permit as applicable. Student researchers must also provide evidence of compliance with the CHED Memorandum Order Number 63 series of 2017 which sets guidelines for off-campus activities, if applicable. 
Additionally, the university president issued University Memo 2021-020 dated 8 September 2020, which establishes the interim guidelines for continuing research during flexible learning. In this university memo, special considerations related to face-to-face -face interactions and research-related travel activities require submission to the Kinaadman University Research Office relevant documentation and approval by relevant authorities. Student researchers must similarly provide evidence of compliance with this university regulation during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Each protocol undergoes a preliminary screening by the REO administrative staff to confirm that all necessary documentation has been submitted and completed. The REO administrative staff will inform through email the principal investigators regarding incomplete protocol submissions, indicating reasons and specific instructions on how these will be addressed. For example, uploading of applicable documents, revising specific sections into a correct version, etc. Principal investigators with complete protocol package are notified also through email of their REC package number and the type of review under which the protocol is categorized by the REB chair. The REB chair classifies the study protocol review pathway as either exempt from ethical review, expedited review, or full committee review. Following are categorized as exempted from ethical review. Number one, protocols that neither involve human participants nor identifiable human tissue, biological samples, or data available in the public domain for systematic reviews or meta-analysis. Number two, protocols for institutional quality assurance purposes, evaluation of public service programs, public health surveillance, educational evaluation activities, and consumer acceptability test. Number three, protocols that involve the use of publicly available data or information provided that the information is recorded by the investigator in such a manner that the identity of the human participants cannot readily be ascertained directly or through identifiers linked to the participants, the investigator does not contact the participants and the investigator will not re-identify participants. Also, provided that the research involves only information collection and analysis involving the researcher or investigator's use of identifiable information when that use is regulated under the Data Privacy Act of 2012 and its implementing rules and regulations. A protocol is also exempted from ethical review if it involves research that only includes interactions involving survey procedures, interview procedures, or observation of public behavior, including visual or auditory recording, provided that any disclosure of the human participants' responses outside the research would not reasonably place the participants at risk of criminal or civil liability or be damaging to their financial standing, employability, or reputation, or the information obtained is recorded in such a manner that the identity of the human participant cannot readily be ascertained directly or through identifiers linked to the participant and that the data 
is completely anonymous with no identifiable private information being collected, the data is not considered to be sensitive or confidential in nature, the issues being researched are not likely to upset or disturb participants, vulnerable groups are not included, and there is no risk of possible disclosures or reporting obligations. Exempt from review means that a protocol does not need to undergo either full or expedited review after a prelim preliminary assessment by the REB chair or a designated member of the REB. The determination of whether or not a particular research is exempt from full committee or expedited review is made, therefore, by the Research Ethics Board and not the researcher. The following are qualified for expedited review. Number one, research involving materials, for example, data, documents, records, or specimens that had been collected or will be collected solely for non-research purposes, such as for treatment or diagnosis. This includes secondary analysis of existing or future data sets, such as databases containing medical records, criminal justice system records, educational records, or survey data. Number two, collection of data from voice, video, digital, or image recordings made for research purposes. This includes observational studies of human behavior and characteristics where personal identifiers are recorded and the data are not particularly sensitive in nature. Number three, research on individual or group characteristics or behavior. For example, research on perception, cognition, motivation, identity, language, communication, cultural beliefs or practices, and social behavior, or research employing survey, interview, oral history, focus group, program evaluation, human factors evaluation, or quality assurance methodologies. This includes survey research where the respondents are approached in a natural setting, either personally or through a communications medium, for example, by email, telephone, or the internet, and participation is voluntary. Protocols qualified for expedited review are, in other words, minimal risk study. What does minimal risk mean? Minimal risk generally means that the probability and magnitude of physical or psychological harm anticipated in the research are not greater in or of themselves than those ordinarily encountered in daily life or in routine medical, dental, or psychological examination. Full committee review shall be required for proposals that entail more than minimal risks to participants or those that involve vulnerability issues. Vulnerable participants shall require special protection because of special characteristics or situations that render them as such. Vulnerable participants are those who are relatively or absolutely incapable of deciding for themselves whether or not to participate in a study for reasons such as physical or mental disabilities, poverty, asymmetric power relations, for example, between teacher and students, supervisor and associates, etc. 
and marginalization among others and who are at greater risk to some harms. Vulnerable groups shall not be included in research unless such research is necessary to promote the welfare of the population represented and it cannot be performed on non-vulnerable persons or groups. Protocols that do not involve human participants nor identifiable human tissue, biological samples, and human data as described earlier are technically exempt from review but will be subject to expedited review at the level of the REB chair. Protocols that qualify for exemption are automatically archived and classified as inactive and protocol records will be made available by the XUREB for three years from date. Expedited review refers to the number of members doing the ethical review rather than the length of time it requires. The reviewers, either of full committee or of expedited protocols, are given 14 days to return to the REO Administrative Assistant the review documents. What does the REC look for when reviewing your protocol? The participation of human beings in research can only be justified if the social uh, value of the study can be established. Social value refers to the relevance of the study to an existing social or health problem such that the results are expected to bring about a better understanding of related issues or contribute to the promotion of well-being of individuals, their families, and communities. Obtaining informed consent is a process that is begun when initial contact is made with a potential participant and continues throughout the course of the study. By informing potential participants, by repetition and explanation, by answering their questions as they arise, by ensuring that they understand each procedure, and by obtaining agreement from them, the researchers elicit their informed consent and in so doing manifest respect for their dignity and autonomy. Informing the potential participants shall not be simply a ritual recitation of the contents of a written document. Rather, the researcher shall convey the information, whether orally, in writing, or other modes of communication in a language and manner that suit the individual's capacity and level of understanding. All research involving human participants shall be preceded by a careful assessment of predictable risks, burdens, and foreseeable benefits to the research participant or to others. Every precaution shall be taken into account to minimize the negative impact of the study on the research participant's well-being according to the ethical principle of beneficence or non-maleficence. Research is justified if there is a reasonable likelihood that the population from which the participants are derived stand to benefit from the research and only if the chance of possible benefit outweighs the risks of possible harm to the participants. Researchers must respect participants' right to privacy. Unless required by law, the confidentiality of information shall at all times be observed. Records that link individuals to specific information shall not be released. This requirement shall be included in the informed consent form. 
researchers shall refrain from identifying individuals or groups when release of information about them can expose them to possible harm or social stigma unless required by law. The researcher shall describe his or her data protection plan in the protocol, including the steps to be taken so that all who have access to the data and the identities of the respondents can safeguard the privacy and confidentiality. In research involving human participants, the principle of justice refers primarily to distributive justice, which requires the equitable distribution of both the burdens and the benefits of participation in research. As such, there should be fair selection in the choice of population, sampling, and assignments. Research participants should be reimbursed for lost earnings, travel costs, and other expenses incurred when taking part in a study. Where there is no prospect of direct benefit, participants may be given a reasonable and appropriate incentive for the inconvenience. The payments shall not be so large as to induce prospective participants to consent to participate in the research against their better judgment. For example, that is the undue inducement. There should also be just compensation for harms brought about by participation in the research. Ethical research is characterized by transparency. Transparency imposes responsibilities on researchers to disclose information about their affiliations, financial interests, or other loyalties that may affect their objectivity and the integrity of their research output. Researchers must be transparent about aspects of a study that may have an impact on the rights, health, and safety of participants or in respect to information that may have a bearing on the decision of participants to give or withhold their informed consent. The REC also looks into the qualification of the researcher or researchers. They look into the adequacy of the facilities and community involvement. Based on these considerations, there are four possible actions of the REC on a research protocol. Approved means that the protocol is satisfactory and needs no amendment or correction. Minor modifications means that the protocol is essentially ethically sound. However, the principal investigator needs to make some minor amendments before it can be approved. Major modifications means that the protocol is essentially ethically sound. However, the principal investigator needs to make some major revisions before it can be approved. And disapproved if the protocol is deemed ethically unacceptable and does not comply with the ethical requirement for research proposals. So, if modification is not needed, the chair issues a certification of approval to the principal investigator and that is the end of the initial review process. However, if modification is needed, whether it is minor modification or mo major modification, the REO administrative assistant communicates this panel action to the researcher. The researcher should comply with all recommendations and submits all required documents. The committee or 
reviewer reviews the resubmitted documents of the um, researcher and if deemed satisfactory, then the rev chair will issue the certification of approval to the researcher. If not, then the research ethics office or the RAO administrative assistant will communicate the panel action to the researcher and the researcher will therefore be asked to comply with all the recommendations and to resubmit the required documents and the committee or the reviewer will again review the resubmitted documents until it is deemed to have satisfactorily addressed the recommended modification. Also like to emphasize in this presentation the responsibilities of the principal investigator. The principal investigator must ensure that the protocol is scientifically sound and of scientific and social value. He or she must ensure that there are adequate resources, for example, time, funding, space, and staff to conduct the research. The principal investigator also should provide sufficient oversight over all study activities and tasks delegated to others to ensure that the research is conducted in compliance with all applicable regulations and EXU policies and procedures. The principal investigator should also analyze and study reports, adhere to the pre-planned protocol analysis plan and in accordance with accepted statistical principles and guidelines for reporting studies. He or she should store, retain, and protect data and study records for at least three years after completion of the study, close the study once it ends, or when personal identifiers are removed from the data or biospecimen and all codes and keys are destroyed. The principal investigator also should obtain and document informed consent of participants or participants' legally authorized representatives prior to the subject's participation in the research, obtain prior approval from the rev for any modifications of the previously approved research, including modifications to the informed consent process and document, ensure that progress reports and requests for continuing review and approval are submitted to the REB in accordance with the policies, procedures, and actions of the REB. The REB is required to regularly review previously approved research to ensure human subjects' protections remain appropriate over the life of a study. This process is called continuing review. For studies determined to qualify for full review, continuing review is required at intervals appropriate to the degree of risk. Um, this is done annually at a minimum unless the study status has progressed to data analysis only or acquisition of long-term follow-up data collected as part of routine care. Justifications for continuing review for research that qualified for expedited review might include the following. The project is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration or by another sponsor that requires continuing review. The project involves additional regulatory oversight. The study procedures or risks indicate greater oversight is necessary or other research-specific conditions or considerations that apply. When continuing review is required, investigators must submit 
an application for continuing review three to four weeks in advance of the approval expiration date. That brings us to the end of this presentation. I sincerely appreciate that I've had this opportunity to present to you. I'd like to finish with this quote from Rodney Davis. If you are guided by a spirit of transparency, it forces you to operate with a spirit of ethics. Success comes from simplifying complex issues, addressing problems head on, be truthful and transparent. If you open yourself up to scrutiny, it forces you to a higher standard. I believe you should deliver on your promise. Promise responsibly.